up nose to do a good burnout. You gotta unlock every horsepower. The number one reason for Miata's losing horsepower is improperly installed timing belts. So that's the inspiration for my new shirt. Now in case you live under a rock, I featured this one simple trick on my channel about six years ago where you use basic tools and it makes it really easy to put your timing belt on. And I really didn't think much of it past that. But you guys are constantly sending me loads of pictures of your own timing trifecta. So I decided to put it on a shirt and make it available in my shop, thecarpassionchannel.com slash store, if you want to get one for yourself. Hello again, friend. You thought we were done here? You're dead wrong, because I got another piece of highly requested merch, and that is the Car Passion hat. These are available on the shop right now, as well as the shirts. Free shipping to any US location. International shipping is available. The quantities are limited, so if you want one, you gotta jump on it right now. Thanks for the support, guys. Back to the video. What's going on, everybody? Greg Peters here, Miata Dad, and today I'm with my younger son, Too Soon Jr. We're gonna be ripping out the stock ECU today and installing the standalone by Motorsport Electronics, the ME442. It's the first mod for Too Soon Jr., okay? It's about time we got the ball rolling on this thing. It's gonna be a fun day. If all goes well, I'll be able to fire the car up and at least drive it around the block. And hopefully you guys are gonna learn something along the way. So strap in, buckle up, and let's jump into this. Alright, so what I've got here is the Motorsport Electronics ME442, and I'll be installing this on my 1999 NB Miata. And whether you went with the 442 or the 221 ECU, and whether you're installing this on an NA or an NB, the process is going to be nearly identical. If I can think of any differences along the way, I'll do my best to highlight them. But as always, this is intended to be a helpful guide to provide some visualizations for your install, not a replacement for the actual installation instruction. So you need to start with your stock ECU that comes out of the car. Now I happen to have a spare ECU here that I'll be doing the surgery on because I want to keep my stock ECU intact for dyno testing purposes. But you can use the one that comes out of your car and you can always revert back to stock whenever you like. Just remove the mounting brackets from the ECU followed by the four screws that hold the case together so you can expose that Windows 98 era computer circuitry. Just look at it. Next up, you can whip out that beautiful Motorsport Electronics board and drop it into your case, but just for mock-up purposes. See, there's a couple slight modifications we need to do in order to accommodate the new standalone setup. And one of them is to drill a hole for the map sensor signal line that's actually gonna go into the ECU case and hook up to the board. And I made the hole in the ECU case pretty small and then double wrapped the portion of the line with heat shrink wrap that would actually be touching that metal part just to give it a little bit of extra protection. Give that a little zip tie action for good measure. Now I thought I was done for a second here, but um, I actually completely forgot that I need to make a n two more holes on the other side, one for the tuning cable and one for the wideband cable. And that's one of the areas that the 442 differs from the 221 is the 442 actually has onboard Lambda control. It's got a the, the heating circuit for the sensor and the wideband hooks directly up to the ECU. So you really don't even need to buy a separate wideband setup. This includes a wideband sensor and it plugs into the board itself. And I did actually forget to install the wideband cable here and I <laughs> went ahead and did it once I put the ECU in the car. But nonetheless, those are the holes you need to drill in the case. Once you drill all your holes, plug in the cables and reassemble your ECU, feel free to add any artwork you might like to the outside of the case and the ECU is ready for install into your Miata. Time to get to the fun stuff. All right, now the ECU location does depend on the year of your Miata. If you have a 1.6 liter NA, it's gonna be below the passenger floorboard. If you have a 1.8 liter NA, it'll be behind the passenger seat. 
And if you have an NB, like in this video, it's gonna be right next to your steering column. The ECU is held in with two nuts, one down on the bottom and one up on top buried within those connectors. Now you might need to unplug several of those to give yourself a little bit of working room, but once you remove the two nuts, the ECU will be free. You just need to unplug the three connectors and pull it right out. Now, since your new ECU actually uses a stock case with stock mounting tabs, you can bolt it up just like your stock ECU was. But we have to run some lifelines for the new standalone, starting with the map sensor signal line. This is gonna have to go through your firewall somewhere. Usually you can find a blank grommet that you can drill a hole in or run it through the firewall alongside something else. You'll have to just look around and get creative with this because the different years, the different trims, and the different generations all have a little bit different firewall setup. That line is gonna have to get plugged into the intake manifold somewhere. It's gotta be post throttle body. On my car, I had this capped off port here that I used, but if you don't have any extra ports, you can always cut one of the vacuum lines and tee it off. A lot of people like to tee it off right by the fuel pressure regulator, but the important thing is it has to be plugged into the intake manifold. I wanted my tuning cable to end up in my glove box, so I just fed it behind the dash, which is super easy. There's like a big passage out into the glove box area and then zip tied it up everywhere. You wanna make sure any new cables that you're adding are not gonna interfere with your feet or the pedals in any way. Now my cable just sits in there and when I need to plug it into my laptop, I can just whip it out. Now this is the part where I forgot somehow to plug in the wideband cable to the ECU, but this is the third and final cable that you will have to run. And again, this is just on the 442. So this cable will also need to run from the ECU through the firewall out into the engine bay. If your Miata is 96 or newer, you're gonna have two oxygen sensors and it's best to place the wideband in the upstream location, which means before the cat. I have a California spec NB1 with the pre-cat, so my upstream two sensor location is right here in the exhaust manifold. To get this sensor out, you will need a narrow walled O2 sensor wrench. And if you don't have one, you'll have to drive down to O'Reilly to buy one like I did. Once you've got the stock sensor swapped out with that wideband, or in the case you've got an MA221, once you have a wideband system put in and hooked up to the ECU, yes, you do have to have a wideband in order to run a standalone. Otherwise, it's impossible to tune. It's just, it's basically all guesswork, which defeats the purpose of having a standalone. Anyways, once you get that swapped out, you are ready to configure the ECU and get ready for startup and check out that beautifully stock looking engine bay. Enjoy it boys, cause you know it ain't gonna last forever. And speaking of beautiful, I finally offed those terrible knockoff gauge faces that the Miata came with, and I installed a set of rev limiter GT40 gauges. Check these things out. Okay, let's hop onto our laptop and get this thing fired up, shall we? All right, put the key in the ignition, but hold your horses. We're not gonna fire it up just yet. Go ahead and turn the key to the run position, and then plug that USB tuning cable into your laptop. Now in the Motorsport Electronics tuning software, go up to the ECU menu and click on ECU auto detect. It's gonna bring up this little window, select your ECU and click okay. And as long as all the uh, readouts come up here, then the laptop is connected and communicating with your ECU. Next, you have to load the correct base map for your car. So just come up to the file menu and click on load base map. It's gonna bring up this list right here of all these different base maps. You have to be careful to select the right one. I actually ended up selecting sort of the wrong one for my car, which caused it to start and run a little bit rough, but I'll get into that later in the video. The correct one for me would be MX5 9900, stands for 992000, ME442 1.8 OEM. So I'm gonna load that up and then we can proceed to firing up the car and setting the base timing. We all know how important it is to set the base timing, right guys? Do not skip this step. Coolant temperature is about 60 degrees, so it's not like a freezing start, but it is a cold start. Anyways, okay, let's see what happens. Oh, <laughs> I gotta put the clutch in. <laughs> I was like, it's dead. Okay, well, it did fire. It died. That's pretty much par for the course. Anytime you put a standalone in, it's probably not gonna run perfect. Let's give it another fire and see if it'll run with a little bit of throttle.
All right, well, that's off throttle there, so it's idling fine now. That's good. Dialed. Okay, well, uh, it's time to set base timing. Maybe take this thing for a drive. All right, now I know there's a lot of confusion around exactly what we're doing when we're setting the base timing, but to put it simply, we have to synchronize what the ECU believes the ignition advance is and match that with the mechanical ignition advance of the engine itself. So in the ME software, you're just gonna come down to ignition driver. And then on this fixed fire 10 degree advanced mode, you're gonna set that to yes. And then use a timing light to check the ignition advance on your engine. Now I've always just fired up the engine and set the timing on the fly, mostly because it only requires one person, but if you're concerned with doing that, you think your timing might be way off and you want to go the ultra safe route, you can come over here to the start menu and then go to fueling mode, set that to off. You will have to do a power cycle of the ECU, which just means you have to turn the key all the way off and then turn it back to the run position. Then when you crank the car, it won't be supplied with any fuel. So you can have one person cranking the engine over and a second person with a timing light to check the advance. And if you have a base map, it's probably going to be pretty close to spot on and as I found out here my timing was exactly at 10 degrees. Now if you check your ignition with the timing light and it's off no matter what year your Miata is I recommend fine tuning the base timing with this trigger offset right here. If the timing light reads 2 degrees off let's say 8 degrees or 12 degrees and you're shooting for 10 all you have to do is modify this trigger offset by 2 degrees we'll say go to 104 hit enter and that is going to bring that timing to 10 degrees on the engine. Once the engine reads 10 degrees you can come down here to your fixed fire set it back to no and your base timing is done the last thing i want to show you guys how to do before we drive this thing it's something very important and that is how to take a data log so first thing you're going to do is come up to the logging menu go to configure pc logging it's going to bring up this window right here in this top box you're going to see all the different things that the ecu is able to data log so you can check and uncheck any of these i could just leave them all checked because i can always search for what i'm looking for later delimiter just leave that as a comma it has to do with the csv file that the logger generates and we're actually going to be able to open the data logs in Megalog Viewer. Frequency is how often the data log is sampling the information. So 10 hertz is 10 times per second. That's usually good enough for anything you're looking for. And then the log folder, you can click on the little ellipse here and it's going to bring up the option to select whatever folder you want to send the data log to. Once you're done with that, just click OK and now your logging is configured. Now when you're ready to take a data log, you can either come up to the logging menu and click Start PC logging, or as you can see that hotkey there, just control L will start and stop logging. So that's pretty easy to do, even if you're doing it out on the road. All right, so looking at the wideband in the software, it does seem to be running pretty lean, which is why it's just like, just kind of choppy. It doesn't really have, uh, it doesn't really have much power. I mean, it drives okay. So you could drive it around. When you come to a stop, it returns to idle. It doesn't die out. So that's another important thing. So the car is drivable and it really is, that's that's what a base map is for. The car started and look, I'm driving the car around. This is a 100% unmodified base map. The only thing I've done is verify the base timing, which was spot on. The idle is a little bit choppier than stock. Um, there seems to be a lot of timing advance in the base map. I don't know if that's just so it starts up and idles easier or whatever, but um, it's like around 17, 18 degrees. I like to try to get the car to idle at like 10 degrees, and then I can use that idle advance to kind of save the idle if it is dipping down. Um, there's idle advance settings to where it'll throw some advance at it real quick and save it from dying. But yeah, it just seems to be running pretty lean, definitely low on power, but I just like breeze through the instructions. Again, this is a completely untouched base map. So I think it's pretty impressive that the car is just able to drive around like this and, you know, come up to a stop, returns to idle fine, uh, leaves from a stop sign fine. So yeah, obviously it does need some tuning work, but that is the next step of the process. <sighs> okay, I just realized something stupid that I did as I was reviewing the tune on my computer to just try to learn some more about the software. I just realized why the car had trouble starting and why it's running so poorly. Okay, here in the US, we did not get the 1.6 liter NB, but pretty much everywhere else did. And what I did was accidentally loaded a 1.6 liter 
NB base map into the ECU. So now what I'm gonna try to do, even though it's dark out, is I'm gonna try to load the correct base map and see how the car starts and runs. The car's been sitting pretty much all day. Coolant temperature is 19 degrees Celsius, which is right around 66 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm gonna load this base map up and see how it starts for the first time. And so that's the one I loaded. That is the one I should have loaded. Okay, we still gotta work on those cold start settings for sure. But it didn't die on first startup. And I think I'll take this thing for a lap. See how it runs. All right, so it's actually got enough power to drive on the freeway now. <laughs> now that I put the right tune in it. And it actually drives uh, pretty nice, pretty normal. It's got some rough spots. It's still running a little bit lean, but hey, this is tuning. So I'm glad that's cleared up. Uh, completely my fault, just kind of a stupid mistake. But there's a lot of things that even someone who's sort of experienced with tuning, like myself, can easily overlook. So just be careful with that kind of stuff. And also, I forgot to mention in the video that along with the tuning guide and all the literature that comes with the Motorsport Electronics ECU, it also includes the ability to call Motorsport Electronics and do some troubleshooting over the phone, get your car started, get your car running and stuff like that. So it's a really cool service that they offer. I didn't want to forget to mention that. So back to past self to end out the video. So that is how you install an ME442 or 221 into your Miata. As you can see, very simple stuff. And the car actually started up and I was able to drive it around the block on the completely untuned base map. So pretty impressive stuff so far. Now, there is a lot of terminology in the software and user interface stuff that I still have to do a lot of learning on and I have to learn it very quickly because this Saturday, six days away, I have the first dyno appointment for this car. I'm gonna be doing some tuning, I'm gonna be testing some bolt-ons and I will be walking off of that dyno with more power than the car has right now. Exciting stuff. I hope you're pumped for it. Don't forget to smash that like button if you did enjoy it. Peace out. I will see you in the next one. Oh, <laughs> hello again, friend.